Ahmad, Jabari, Jabari, what is your name? J. <laughs> Jabari. Jabari, right. Jabari. Jabari. Where are you from? Iran. Iran. Okay. How did you come from Iran to first to US and then here? Right, 2015 for my PhD, I came to United States, Washington University in St. Louis, and then after graduation, which was August 20, 2019, I directly came to Mexico. Okay, and uh, in Washington, who was your advisor? Xi'an Tan. Xi'an Tan. I don't know. In, in St. Louis? Washington, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you may start. Okay. The, uh, the title is Essential Normality of Bergman Modulus on Eggs, Egg Domain. Oh, something strange, Egg Domain. What's that? You will explain it. Yes. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, yeah, some part of this. So, first of all, thanks for having me to talk in your seminar. Some part of it is joint work. My, my PhD work with my supervisor, Shiatan. Some part of it is new. I have done it here in CMAT. So first, I am going to talk about three basic concepts that I am going to lose use all the time. These are Hilbert modules, essential normality of operators, and the K1 functor. Then I am going to tell about the Arvison Douglas conjecture and index problem, which motivates most of the things that I am going to tell you about. And then, in the, in the third and the fourth part, I am going to talk about my own work, which are mm -hmm. about the social normality of Bergman modules on egg domains. If time permits, I am going to tell you something about P-essential normality, which is a finer version of normality. But first, I am going to define these notions. So the first notion I'm going to use is Hilbert modules. So what does it mean? So capital A in these slides is always going to denote the ring of polynomials with complex coefficient in M variables. So a Hilbert module is just a Hilbert space together with a ring homomorphism from ring of polynomials to the ring of bounded operators on Hilbert space H. So since your ring A is generated by coordinate function Z1 up to Zm. So the data in a Hilbert A module is exactly a Hilbert space together with an M tuple of commuting bounded operators on it. So the fundamental example is the Bergman space on a domain where the module operations is given by multiplication. Multiplication by polynomial? By polynomials, right. Okay. So this is the basic example, and the more important example is this one, is quotients of these Bergman modules. Wait, wait, wait a minute. If you have a Bergman space and uh -huh. multiply a function by a polynomial, right. okay, by each polynomial, it's a, it, it, it is a bounded operator, so right. it again be, belongs to this yeah. Ber Bergman space, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that gives the Bergman space itself a modular structure, right? Mm -hmm. So that's first example. The second example is the quotients of the previous one by, by ideals, by polynomial ideals. Mm -hmm. So in general, you can consider the quotient of your, of your Bergman module by any, by any closed submodule, but I am going to consider only a specific submodules. I mean, the submodules generated by polynomial ideals. So mm -hmm. you get a polynomial ideal here, I, and then take its closure inside your Bergman space with the topology of your Bergman space. You mod it out, right? So you again, you get a Hilbert, you get a Hilbert modular structure. So from a, as a Hilbert space, this quotient is isometrically isomorphic to the orthogonal complement of I. Mm -hmm. And now this I perp is itself a Hilbert module, the module operations are given by multiplication by polynomials followed by orthogonal projection onto, in, onto I perp. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is what I understand by I perp. So whenever in your slide you see I perp, I mean, consider it as a Hilbert space, but together with Hilbert structure, Hilbert module structure. What is what are the operations? What are the module operations? Go and multiply your Bergman functions, I mean functions in I perp, 
by a polynomial function, and then it might be outside, it might not be any more orthogonal complement to I, so go and orthogonally project onto I pair. So it's a kind of topless operator. Yes. Right, right, right. That is what we are called. So these, so you could call it, right, these are our topless operators. For several reasons, they could be called topless operators. So we're right, but I am going to call them topless operators. So as you see, I have not said anything deep so far because the, so be, the correspondence between this ring homomorphism and this M tuple of commuting operators is pretty much straightforward. But from a conceptual, so but but this correspondence is important from the conceptual point because because it gives you the mentality to think about commuting tuples of commuting operators, bounded operators as a Hilbert as a as a module. And as soon as you have that mentality, that helps you to bring tools from homological algebra and algebraic geometry into multivariable operator theory. That was the original motivation of Thomson and Douglas to introduce this language of modules into multivariable operator theory. And having this mentality, so for example, Arveson developed curvature invariant euler correct characteristics for certain classes of Hilbert modules and prove the gauss bonnet change formula for it. Also, Ronald Douglas, so the, right, he introduced, he introduced resolutions of Hilbert modules by a special classes of modules, for example, by injective, projective, silo modules. He also defined Hilbert polynomials. Also with some other guy, Coven, he developed a theory, now it's called Coven-Douglas theory. So it associates a holomorphic vector bundle to certain classes of multi-operators. And as soon as you have a Hermitian vector bundle, you have canonical connections and you can make sense of curvatures. So as you see, both of these guys, Arveson and Douglas, having the mentality of modules, Hilbert modules in multivariable operator theory, they found a way to define curvature invariance. For uh, but Gilbert modules appear much earlier, so uh, maybe you like uh, Al Alan Cohn, Kasparov, right. all this connect connected with non commutative geometry and case right. theory. Yeah, exactly, right. Right, right. So, so you had a question? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So next, uh, I am soon going to define this K1 functor, which was first defined by Brown, Douglas, Fillmore, but then Kasparov generalized all these. Yeah. These ideas of cone. So that is what I wanted to tell you about Hilbert modules. The next thing is this important notion, essential normality. So all of you know what no normality means. But as whenever I say essential in these slides, essential means up to addition of compact operators. So a Hilbert module, H, is called essentially normal. If the corresponding bound commuting tuple of Hilbert operators associated to it, the CSR algebra they generate or is, is abelian up to compact operators. Uh, just wait a minute. So you mean that each TJ commute with each TK, but if you consider uh, a joint, they commute modular compact. Right, right. So a Hilbert module H, right? The data in the Hilbert module is exactly a Hilbert space H together with T1 up to Tm and M tuple of bounded operators. Mm -hmm. So H is called essentially normal if the commutator of Tj with the adjoint of Tk are all compact. Mm -hmm. Then J and K range from 1 to N. And Tj commute with Tk. Right, because I have always, because in yeah, this, yeah, algebra, yeah, yeah. Right, this algebra A is commutative, so they already commute. Okay, okay. So the only thing is that, right. And a final version is p-essential normality. So a Hilbert module is called p-essentially normal if the commutators of Tj with Tk star are Chatin von Neumann p summable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and in, I just want to add, so in non-commutative geometry, this notion of p-essential normality is important in, in the construction of churn cone characters, and also for studying a smoothness of a structure to define a smooth structures. This is P essential. So you can refer to the fundamental paper of Cohn in IHES, which he entitled Non-Commutative Differential Geometry. Mm -hmm. 
And there is one more notation I'm going to use. Whenever you have a Hilbert module curly H, by sigma I denote, I understand it's joint Taylor spectrum. By sigma E, E stands for essential. I mean, essential Taylor spectrum. So mm -hmm. every one of you know what, what it means, what it means for the spectrum of one single operator, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have several commuting bounded operators on a Hilbert space, there is a notion of joint Taylor spectrum. It is defined by the Kossuth complex, mm -hmm. the exactness of the Kossuth complex. So the definition is very pretty much abstract and elegant, but the point is that exactly because the definition is abstract, it has very good properties. So it, they, were, they were introduced by some guy, J. L. Taylor in 1970. Mm -hmm. An essential Taylor spectrum means, okay, you constitute, you have a M, you have a M tuple of commuting operators, you associate in a canonical way a causal complex to it, and then mold out everything by the ideal of compact operators. That gives you the notion of, the notion of essential spectrum. The most important example here is that if you have a, if you have Bergman space over the M dimensional ball, then the joint Taylor spectrum is given by the closed unit ball. And the essential Taylor spectrum is unit sphere. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm sorry, just yes. one, one, one doubt. Uh, the spectrum, uh, the central spectrum is defined for, for one operator or for, for the generators or uh, right. For the tuple, for, for the, the operators T1, TN? T, right, T1 to TN. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Right, so, but I associate it to the Hilbert module because a Hilbert module is nothing but a Hilbert space together with its with T1 up to TM because T1 up to TM are the bounded operators which define the modular structure on H. So there is a famous notion of essential Taylor spectrum for a commuting tuple of M operators in the literature. Exactly the same definition. Now I am going to call the essential, the essential Taylor spectrum of Hilbert module curly H. Uh, you have M commuting operators. M, M commuting operators, right. M, M is always fixed in these nodes. Okay. This M is here. Always, okay. always whenever I have a Hilbert page, it, a Hilbert module. I am, so it is a Hilbert module over capital A. Capital A in these nodes is always going to be the ring of polynomials with M variables. Uh, yes, my question was just to compare dimension because the uh, Taylor spectrum uh, is uh, the, uh, if you have M elements, it should be M dimensional. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it is. Uh, so exactly corresponds to the dimension of M yeah, dimensional yeah. ball. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. have here. Good connection between dimensions, yeah, yeah, yeah. operators and uh, operators in m-dimensional ball. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Okay. Next, I am going to add a few words about this K1 functor. So, what what is it? Okay. To motivate the definition of K1, I am going to remind you of this spectral theorem. So a spectral theorem together with the spectral multiplicity theorem, what that is, so it classifies normal multi-operators up to unitary equivalence. And the complete classifier in this theory is the cardinal valued multiplicity function. So Brown, Douglas, and Fillmore, these three guys, Brown, Douglas, mm -hmm. and Fillmore in 1970, so they, they, they solve a similar problem. They classify, so why they did, they classified essentially normal operators, essentially normal multi-operators up to essentially unitary equivalence. So as far as I remember, they start from topless operator with continuous symbol. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then uh, figure out that the classes of equivalence are classified by index of the operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. So mm -hmm. that's what I am going to give you a sketch about. I mean, the okay. definition of K1. So the complete classifier here now is this K1 functor. So how I'm going to give you the definition. So uh, how can I motivate? So the definition is very easy and pretty much natural. If, because 
Suppose you have an M tuple of commuting operators, which are essentially normal, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to classify them. So the first of all, the first invariant you can associate to them, right, is their essential spectrum. So that's mm -hmm. a subset that is a compact subset of X, of CM, mm -hmm. right? Their essential joint Taylor spectrum. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I'm going to go to the second step. Now I am going to fix X, fix X, a compact subset of CM, and I am going to I am going to ask myself, what is going to be a complete classifier of all essentially normal multi-operators up to essentially normal equivalence? So, I, so I'm going to think about CSR algebras and the social life of my multi of my essentially normal operators. So I have T1 up to Tm, an M tuple of commuting normal operators, essentially normal operators, right? So what can I say about their CSR algebra? So the only thing I know is that the CSR algebra generated by, the, by them, right, mowed out by the ideal of compact operators is going to be a commutative, a, a commutative CSR algebra. So it is isomorphic to, to C of X. Mm -hmm. Neumann theorem. So and this strange letter means compact operators. What? Uh, this uh, after zero. This means compact operators. Right, 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 exactly. So, so the elements of this complete classifier, K1 of X, so K1 of X, the complete classifier should be a set. The elements are, right, the elements are C a star isomorphism of C of X with mm -hmm. some, with some C a star algebra mode out E mode out by K. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in other words, so in more a structural way, the elements of the complete classifier should be equivalence classes of short exact sequence of the following form. The first term should be the ideal of compact operators. The last term should be the CSR algebra of continuous functions on X. The middle term should be something that makes it into a, into a short exact sequence. And what so is your equivalence relation? What? Right. The, just motivated by homological algebra. So suppose you have the X group into homological algebra. How do you define the equivalence between two short exact sequences? Mm -hmm. So if you have two exact sequences like this, they only differ by this middle term E. So, yeah, and sure. so the they two short exact sequence can be called, should be called equivalent if there is a, right, if there is a CS star map from E to the middle term of the other, which make, which makes, these two, right, this ladder, this ladder of two exact sequences commutative. Mm -hmm. so, the, so it is very easy to K1 of X. So the elements are equivalence classes of short exact sequence of the following form, or I'm going to use another definition is just C star monomorphism from C of X to the Kalkin algebra. So these mm -hmm. are elements of K1 of X. So, so far I have not done anything deep, anything non-trivial. Uh -huh. uh, equivalent classes. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. So if you want to... But, but it, I, is, uh, it is a, K1 of X is a group. What is the group operation? Yes. Right, right. Okay. But next, okay. The next, uh, as a set, it's a non-trivial. The definition is very easy to understand. But these guys, what we have, what these guys have done, they made it so, and you can naturally define an addition operation mm -hmm. just by direct sum of these middle terms E and E prime. So the one thing, one non-trivial thing that these guys did is that they proved that this is an abelian group. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it is commutative is pretty much trivial, but they they proved by a deep theorem of Oikulesko, they proved that you have inverse, you have additive inverse. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, so that made, so the, okay, that made, so K1 of and, X. And, 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 the, and the, with the case of Brown Dogger Filmer, uh, this group is described by some cohomological group. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to tell about that. Okay. So, whatever I have told you in this slide, so you can simplify in this scheme. So, so a spectral, so from, if you think about CSR, CSR algebra representations, the spectral theory is the theory which classifies CSR representation of C of X on B, 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 H. 
where H is a separable infinite dimensional Hilbert space. But this theory, the, this Brown Douglas Fillmore theory, is the homotopy version of this one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The formation version mm -hmm. of a spectral theory. So it classifies C star representation from C of X to the Kalkin algebra. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I am going to just tell you about one slide, one more slide about K1. So if I am supposed to tell you, like, the first four facts about K1, these are the following. These are what Brown, Douglas, Fillmore, and the later guys proved the most important thing. So K1 of X is finitely generated if X is like a manifold or homotopy, homotopically mm -hmm. equivalent to a finite C star, fi, finite CW complex. So in other words, it's a small. Mm -hmm. The next term is that, the next thing is that K1 can be computed. How? So there are some, so, so there, are, there are some short exact sequences, even by Larry Brown and also these guys, which expresses K1 that I have just described. They relate them to the Atiyah Herzebrock topological K theory functors. Mm -hmm. That's the way they can be computed. And the last thing is, I'm going to tell you about what is K1 of odd dimensional spheres. Mm -hmm. If you have odd dimensional spheres, K1 of X is going to be, as an abelian group, it, it, it's going to be Z. So it's free with one generator, and a gener there are many ways to give the generator, but I am going to use this one. The generator of this abelian group is given by what is called the Toplitz extension. So what do I mean? So I need to give you a canonical element of K1 of X, right? So I need to give you a representation of C of X on some Kalkin algebra. Mm -hmm. The Kalkin algebra of some infinite separable Hilbert space, and I'm going to choose the Hardy space or the Bergman space. And the representation is just send your continuous function on X to the coset of the topless operator, the coset in the Kalkin algebra. And the Z corresponds to the index of this. Right. What? This is an element of Z, which classifies. Right, right. It's, uh, it corresponds to the, to, the, to the index of this set of operators. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, right. And the only thing you need, the only non trivial thing you need to check, check about to make sure that this is a representation, you need to check that TFTG is equal to TFG. I mean, mm -hmm. the coset is equal, yeah. but that is based on this. Uh, the main ingredient is this fact. I mean, mm -hmm. to prove that this is a CS star algebra representations, you only need this non-trivial fact that the commutator of the Bergman projection P with multiplication by continuous symbols is going to be compact. Mm -hmm. So if you use this fact, then there is a very clever, I mean, very, very famous trick in Toplitz algebra literature, which proves for you that this is a representation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have, I have told you about the basic concepts that I'm going to use, which were Hilbert modules, essential normality, and the K1 functor. And then I am going to tell about the motivations behind what I have been doing, which are Arveson Douglas conjecture. So, what is it? It's a conjecture in multivariable operator theory. And this is it. So, let I be homogeneous ideal of the polynomial ring of M complex variables and let omega be a bounded, a strongly pseudo convex domain with a smooth boundary. Then the Arveson conjecture that the Bergman module mowed out by the closure of I, which I have told you, so that is as a Hilbert module is isometrically isomorphic to I perp. The module operations are given by Toplitz operators. Is essentially normal. That means chocolate separator essential and normal. Right, right. So, and a finer, so this was conjectured by Arveson. Then Douglas came along and gave a finer version. He even asserted that this I perp is P essentially normal, is P is greater than the complex dimension of I. Mm -hmm. The complex dimension of the variety defined by I. Uh, let me see if I have time. Okay, I guess I'm going to skip this part. But, but Arveson had a very concrete motivation to, which brought this to this conjecture. So these are explained in these three sentences. So he wanted, so Arveson wanted to develop a 
a structure theory for contractions, for tuples of commuting contractions. Mm -hmm. So he found a model theory for them. The model theory, the model of the spherical contractions that he had in mind was the multi shifts of the drawer universe on a space compressed to co invariant subspaces. So he had a model theory, and whenever you have a model theory, so what you need to do, you need some invariance to distinguish among your different models, right? So he came along with, he defined some curvature operator. So to, to any multi-shift of the Delorey Arvesson space, he associated a curvature operator, which by its definition, it was real value. But in all of the examples he computed, those that curvature invariant turned out to be an integer. Mm -hmm. Not only an integer, but that integer was also a stable under perturbation by compact operators. So that that made Arveson sure that. So he he as a next step he tried to realize that curvature invariant as the Fretholm as a Fretholm index. Mm -hmm. So he tried to answer this question. He asked himself, what is a good sufficient condition to make an spherical contraction a commuting tuple of spherical contractions fretholm? So as soon as you ask yourself this question, you readily get, I mean, two or three lines of computations that brought you to this conjecture. I mean, if this conjecture is true, then the model theory, the elements of the model theory of Arveson turns out to be fretholm, so he was able to associate an invariant, invariant to that. That was his mm -hmm. motivation. So next, I'm going to tell you about some positive, positive results relating this conjecture. So this conjecture was proved for monomial ideals by Arveson himself, then another proof by Douglas, then another proof we found. So I found together with Douglas, my advisor, Xiao Tan and Go Liang Wu. If I is principal, so the conjecture is true. If I, in, in low dimensions and low co-dimensions, it's also true. Also, the most important thing is this geometrical version in geometrical situation. So this conjecture is for every homogeneous ideal. But if you assume that your ideal is radical, so then, then, then your ideal is the vanishing ideal of some variety, a smooth variety, a smooth algebraic variety. No, not a smooth. Right. No, just consider this situation. I'm going to tell you that these three guys, these three group of people with, with several approaches, they prove that if I, if your ideal is the vanishing ideal of some homogeneous algebraic variety, a smooth away from the origin, then the conjecture is true. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is called geometric Arveson Douglas conjecture. Okay, next I'm going to tell about you the Douglas index problem. I told you that this brown, brown Douglas Fillmore, they classified essentially normal operators. So as soon as Ronald Douglas became aware of this conjecture, he asked a specific, a more specific, a finer question. He asked, so suppose the, suppose the situation in the Arveson's conjecture, right? So suppose you have a homogeneous ideal I and you consider I pair. Oh, what do you mean uh, homogeneous ideal? Right, right. Homogeneous ideal. What is that homogeneous ideal? Homogeneous means that it is generated by homogeneous elements, homogeneous polynomials. Homogeneous polynomials. Right, that is what. All we're... homogeneous of set of order. Right, homogeneous set of generators. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So suppose that your ideal is homogeneous, and suppose that the Arvidsson's conjecture is true in the sense that I perp is essentially normal. Then, as soon as you have some essentially normal Hilbert module, you can ask what is what element of K1 it represents. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is called Douglas's index problem. Mm -hmm. So he asked, so that is some vague problem, but he has some specific conjecture in, in the geometric situation. So if I is the vanishing ideal of an algebraic variety which intersects the boundary transversely. Then he conjectured that the, the elements of K1, which this I pair presents, represents, right, is coincides with another famous element there, which is given by a spin C Dirac operator mm -hmm. associated to the Cauchy Riemann structure. So, what do I mean by this? So, I have already, so by Arveson's conjecture, this I pair is essentially normal, so it definitely gives you an element in some K1. But I am going to tell you that 
if this geometric noise geometric situation happens that the intersection is transversal, then the, the, the algebraic variety intersection with the boundary is going to be a smooth manifold. So it's, it's a smooth hypersurface inside CM, right? So, it's in, it's, so it has a Cauchy-Riemann structure. So it has a Cauchy-Riemann structure. You can associate a spin C Dirac operator to it. And as soon as you have a Dirac operator, you can associate exactly the same way that I have, I have defined the topless extension for you. You can, define, you can define another extension. How? So remember how I defined the topless extension for you. I have sent a continuous function right, to the topless operator. right? And how topless operator is defined? It is defined by multiplication followed by the Bergman projection. Mm -hmm. Now, the topless operator in a, just replace the Bergman projection by, by the projection onto the positive side of the, of the, of the eigenvalues of, of the spin C Dirac operator. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so you have a Dirac operator. So a spin C Dirac operator is an elliptic operator, right? And every elliptic operator on a closed manifold, it is, it has, a, it has a basis of eigenval, eigenvectors, right? It has a basis of eigenvectors. Go and consider the eigenvectors and the, uh, right? All the eigenvectors turn out to be, so let P, so instead of the Bergman projection, consider the the orthogonal projection, right, from the Hilbert space of the rock operator, which is the L2 section of L2 sec, L2 spinors, to the subspace generated by eigenvectors of positive eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Go in the previous in the topless extension. Go and replace the top. Go and replace the Bergman projection by projection onto the positive side of the spectrum of the spin C Dirac operator. That again, again, this property holds. Again, uh, again, this P commutes with multiplication operator with continuous symbols up to compact operators that give you a representation. And I'm going to tell you that these represent representations coincide with the representation which defines like pair. Go on, Nikolai. Uh, question. Uh, do you have a slide uh, with some uh, very simple example of this situation with spin Dirac operator, yeah. projection? <laughs> yeah, you always predict what I'm going to tell next, right? Okay, great. Right. So if you, if omega is the, just a unit disk, its boundary is the unit circle, right? And okay. in cons let I, your homogeneous ideal, just be zero. Then the spin C Dirac operator is exactly this one. Mm -hmm. The uh, this is theta, this theta, theta, theta is angle. Theta angle, plural angle, right? Mm -hmm. And then, okay. And then, okay, let's think about, so what are the eigen, so you can easily find the eigen vectors of this one. These are exponential functions, right? Mm -hmm. Such that mm -hmm. their, their frequency are given by positive integers. So then the, then the projection on the positive side is exactly the Zeko projection, if you think about it. For a bit. Mm -hmm. And then, okay. So what do you have? So in this situation, everything is explicit. So you have two extensions. You have topless extension and the top, an extension given by the Zego projection, right? And you have you you are saying me that these two representations, these two representations are equal in K1. So since they are give the same elements in K1, their index theory is the same. You unravel it, you get this famous theorem, uh, index theorem, which is attributed to Krein, maybe. Crying lacks different guys. Which, mm -hmm. if you have a, if you have a, if you have a nover zero continuous function capital F on the unit disk on the, on the unit circle, right? Mm -hmm. The topless operator associated to it is Fretholm, and the index is is given by the winding number. Mm -hmm. Minus one. Minus one times minus one. The higher dimensional version is this one. Yeah, Mm. Right. If omega is a is a general a strongly pseudo convex domain domain with a smooth boundary, when i is zero, then you get this index theorem. If you have a if you have a matrix n by n mat matrix of symbols of a smooth symbols, right, on the bound on a, a strongly pseudo convex domain, that the topless operator associated to it, if 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 this matrix is invertible. Then the topless operator associated to this symbol, to this matrix symbol, 
turns out to be Fretton, the index is given by this guy over here. So how I, I derive this formula? So this is the consequence of this conjecture plus 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 Atiyo Singer's index theorem. Well, I wait about uh, without Atiyo Singer index theorem. If you have uh, a matrix of uh, n times n matrix, which right. is invertible, right. then the index index is uh, nothing but a representative of the homotopy classes of such matrices. Exactly right. Uh -huh, uh -huh, is, uh -huh, uh -huh. That is more or less both periodicity the theorem. But yeah. you can derive it. So you have a two-plus operator. So this is your two-plus operator. By this conjecture, and this conjecture have been been proved in the in the this geometric situation. So that that, and, that and, tells and, you that and, the and. index of the two-plus operator equals the index of the spin C Dirac operator. And this, the index of the spin C Dirac operator is given. Uh -huh. And by this others. is connected, and this is connected with uh gamatopy classes of sphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Because because the most natural way to prove this Atiyah Singer is but this but periodicity theorem exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are about the motivations. Now I am gonna mm, start telling what I have been doing. Okay, so let me another time remind you of this conjecture. So this Arvison's conjecture: the ingredients are a homogeneous ideal. You have a, a strongly pseudo-convex domain, and the assertion is that the I perp is essentially normal. I'm going to tell you that, okay, if now I'm going to tell you that if you replace a strongly pseudo convex with weakly pseudo convex, this conjecture might not be true anymore. Okay, let me tell you about some negative results. So the conjecture is about a, a strongly pseudo convex, but people became interested to, to, to understand what happens to this conjecture for weakly pseudo convex domains. So I'm going to start with this. If your domain is a strongly pseudo-convex, then the essential normality of the Bergman module, not the quotient, just the Bergman module. Mm -hmm. Just the Bergman module on a strongly pseudo-convex domain. The essential normality exactly comes from the theory that Butot de Monvel developed in his Invenzione paper. So he understood topless operators, right, as pseudo-convex, pseudo-differential operators. So mm -hmm. whenever you have, so you have two, two you have two topless operators, right, and so they correspond to pseudo differential of order zero. So their commutator is a pseudo differential operator of order at most minus one. And according to the calculus that Butot de Monvel developed, every pseudo differential operator of negative order turns out to be compact. Uh, am I right? That's a very nice result of the Butot de Monvel. Great. If you consider Toplitz operator uh, whose symbol is pseudo differential operator of order Great. zero. Right, right, right. Model a compact operator is equivalent to the Toeplitz operator with functional symbol. And what you should do, you need to consider cotangent bundle. You consider uh, a construct function whose uh, uh, first of all you need to consider a point, and then restrict to the uh, this essential direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the cotangent bundle, this is in this way you obtain a, a, a functional symbol. Which is modular compact equivalent to the pseudo differential symbol. Exactly, exactly. That uh, was because he was an expert in PDEs. Okay, and he, yeah, uh, this uh, is what one of the invention of Butte de Manuel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but next I'm going to tell you about weakly pseudo convex domain. If omega is just a weakly pseudo convex domain, a smooth or not, then the essential normality of Bergman module. So you can easily show using the formalism of J. J. Cohn. The essential normality of the Bergman module is equivalent to the compactness of this D bar Norman operator, N1, mm -hmm. on zero one forms. And the people in, in the community, in the, in the several complex variable literature, so they have developed a lot of sufficient necessary and also if and only if condition for this operator to be compact. Using their results, you can prove that the Bergman module on, for example, domains of finite type or pseudo convex domain with a real analytic boundary turns out to be turns out to be essentially normal. So these are two examples where the Bergman module, right, on these domains is not essentially normal. For example, the polydisc or the Hartox triangle, which is more or less biholomorphic to the polydisc. Mm -hmm. And also there is a beautiful paper, an old paper by these guys, Salinas, Uppmayer, and Shu. 
So they found geometric, if I, they completely solved the problem, which, which Bergman modules over complete pseudo-convex, complete Reinhardt domains of C2 are essentially normal. There, it is essentially normal if and only if this geometric condition holds, if the boundary of omega contains no one-dimensional holomorphic component. Okay, but that was mm -hmm. just a review of the literature. So what I have done, I have started studying these essential normality of Bergman module and quotients by ideals when your domain is an egg domain. So I have mm -hmm. started with these egg domains. So this is called complex ellipsoids. Yeah. But what I am gonna I am gonna state from now on is true for these complex ellipsoid or this generalization of them. These are called generalized ellipsoids, generalized complex ellipsoid. And look and, how and all and all of them are in her domain. They are what? Reinhardt domains. They're Reinhardt domains. They're, co they're complete Reinhardt domains, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are complete Reinhardt domains. And right. And look how, and for more general domains, what are these more generalized domains? Look how omega 2 is obtained from omega 1. You just need to go and replace one of these absolute values, ZJs, right, by an expression of exactly the same form. So mm -hmm. I am going to call this inflation. So omega, do, omega 2 is obtained from omega 1 by inflation process. And you can do inflation process on omega 2 finitely many times, you, so you get more and more generalized domains. What I'm going to tell you from now on is going to be true for all of these domains. And here is a note. So there are complete this, right this, this, this inflation, inflation process is more or less the same as we use the word quasi-homogeneous. You use what? Quasi homogeneous. You separate separate uh, you define this all n variables of two to exactly. portions and do with each portion something. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the term, technical term is as you said, quasi homogeneous, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So these are complete run out of domains. So they are to check that they are I'm gonna tell you that all of them are all of them are weakly pseudo convex. Mm -hmm. So the only thing you need to check to check that they are log convex and they are log convex. They are log convex, so all of them turn out to be pseudo convex. For example, this omega one. So if it is it is pseudo convex, weakly pseudo convex for every PJ positive. If PJ are greater than one, then this omega one is also C two. It makes sense to talk about it to be a strongly pseudo convex. But uh, yeah, yeah, just a question, just to just to, to remind. Pseudo convex is connect is connected or defined by the positivity of Levy form. Positivity, semi positivity of the Levy 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 form, right? Uh -huh. Levy form for complex tangent vectors. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And right. So the, all of them. So this omega one is always weakly pseudo convex, but only when, and, and it is. A strongly pseudo convex with C2 boundary only when all of these PJs are equal to one, mm -hmm. which reduces to the open for, to the open ball. So mm -hmm. almost always this omega one, omega two, omega three, they're all weakly pseudo convex. So and we are gonna study what happens to the Bergman's to, to the Arvison's conjectures in the case of these balls. Uh, or or so the first so the first thing, so this was proved before our paper appeared. So people knew that the Bergman module, the Bergman module over omega one, so omega one from now on is gonna be this mm -hmm. complex So The people knew that the Bergman module of omega one is essentially normal. How do you prove it? Okay, so you have the, the easiest way is that, so you have a orthonormal basis for your, for your Hilbert module, right? These are given by monomials. You can find, you can find explicit formulas for the norm of this, your, monomial basis, right? Mm -hmm. And also for omega two, this generalized complex ellipsoid. So, so you have some monomials or orthonormal, uh, an orthogonal basis, and you have explicit formulas for the norm of your basis elements in terms of ratio of ratio of gamma functions. This, this is beta, beta function, which mm -hmm. is ratio of gamma functions. So now let us, let us prove this one. To prove this one, so you have a basis for it, right? You go and compute the operators that you want to prove that they are, 
they are compact. So this is a commutator of multiplication by ZJ and it's adjoint. Mm -hmm. If you apply it on your basis element monomial Z alpha, so that's going to be a diagonalizable operator, the eigenvalue you can explicitly define. And just by the asymptotic formula for the ratio of, of gamma function, you can easily prove that this gamma goes to zero, disappears mm -hmm. when this when the when when the norm of this your index alpha one up to alpha n goes to infinity. So that's the way to prove that a diagonalizable operator is compact. You can do the same for this one, for the commutator of multiplication by Z J and adjoint of Z K. So this is not diagonalizable, but it is the, you call it T. So this T is not diagonalizable, but T T star is. Mm -hmm. So T T star is diagonalizable. You go and compute its eigenvalues, and you know that an operator T is compact if and only if T T star is diagonal, if is compact. Mm -hmm. So you can easily prove this theorem over here just by pure computations. Everything is explicit. So what new we have done is this one. So people before us knew about the essential normality of Bergman operators. So what we proved using uh, methods from homological algebra, so we proved that the Bergman module over omega 1, omega 2, or omega 3, mowed out by the closure of every monomial ideal is essentially normal. This is what we proved. So mm -hmm. how do we do it? So we use a basic fact attributed to Arvison and Douglas, and this is this one. If this is the fact. If you have a short exact sequence of Hilbert modules and bounded module homomorphisms between them, if you know that the middle one is essentially normal, then the first one is essentially normal if and only if the last one is. Mm -hmm. So now, how? let's see how we prove that I perp. So we, we prove that I perp is essentially normal. Let's see how we did it. So first of all, First of all, there is a short exact sequence, right? Which terms, which, which the mm -hmm. middle term is this one, which we already know that essentially normal. The first term is I closure. The last term is I perp, which we want to show that essentially normal. So by this fact, since we know that the middle term is essentially normal, to prove that this one is essentially normal is equivalent to show that I closure is essentially normal. Mm -hmm. But then we, we had a specific construction. So starting from the combinatorix of a, of a monomial ideal, so we found, we constructed an explicit long exact sequence which resolves. So we provided a long exact sequence which, which resolves I perp. And all of the terms, all of these curly, curly, curly A, Z, A naught, curly A1, curly AK, all of them are essentially normal. And in fact, I can tell you exactly what are those. These, so we have resolved I perp. Uh, sorry, I closure. We have we have resolved I closure by finite by a long exact sequence of essentially normal operators, and each of these AK are explicit, and they mm -hmm. are in fact direct sums of Bergman spaces over lower dimensional balls. Sorry, not lower dimensional balls. If omega, so, omega one is a complex ellipsoid, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Go, so what are these AKs, the AIs? They are direct sums of Bergman modules, not over omega one, but intersection of omega one with, with, with planes, with Z1 mm -hmm. plane, Z2 plane, Z3 plane, and finitely many intersections of those. So, mm -hmm. but, so I, have, I, I don't have time to tell you what are exp, these guys explicit. Okay. I'm going to tell you that they have some explicit construction as direct sum of Bergman modules over lower dimensional objects. And those lower dimensional objects are just intersections of omega 1 with, for example, z1 equal to 0, z1, z2 equal to 0, and things like that. And all of them, you can easily check that they are essentially normal. The maps turn out to be homomorphism, bounded module homomorphisms. And right, so you have this long exact sequence. And which all of the terms are essentially normal. So what you do, you go and split your long, long exact sequence into finitely many short exact sequences. You mm -hmm. apply these facts several many times, and it proves for you automatically that I, I closure is essentially normal. Mm -hmm. When I closure is essentially normal, I purpose is essentially normal, and that is the assertion in the Bergman, in, in, in the statement in the Arvison's conjecture. But Arvison's conjecture was for 
a strongly pseudo-convex domain, but in this theorem, we prove it for weakly pseudo-convex domain, for a large class of weakly pseudo-convex domain, which are, which are X, mm -hmm. complex ellipsoid under higher generalizations. Mm -hmm. So let's see what do we have next. Okay. And not only the Arbison's conjecture, we can also give an answer to the Douglas's problem. The Douglas's problem was that, okay, we proved that I is essentially normal, but Douglas asked us to give you know, what element in the K1 I perp represents. Mm -hmm. so as soon as you have you have this, so you have this long exact sequence. So you can you can give a formula for the class given by I perp. So what you mm -hmm. do is that you go for, for each of these, for example, for curly A1, each of them is a Hilbert module. So the Hilbert is, so the modular structure is given by compressions of shifts, compressions mm -hmm. of multiplication by polynomials, in other words, topless operators. So go and consider the topless operator, the C star algebra generated by topless operators. Right? That gives this guy a, a structure of so, uh, that gives you a C star algebra. So I have denoted here by fractor T of curly A Q. Mm -hmm. So that is the topless, the C star algebra generated by the topless operator, which gives the modular structure of Hilbert module AQ. And then, okay, just by standard reasonings in homological algebra, you can prove that the class given by I perp is just the alternating sum of the classes given by topless operators. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the only index formula I know about which addresses the Douglas's problem for uh, in non-geometric case. Mm -hmm. Because the geometric case, I told you that the uh, index formula was given by a spin CD rock operator. But in, in our case, a monomial ideal is in general highly non-radical. Mm -hmm. So, and then what I'm going to tell okay, I have five minutes and I'm going to tell you something very short about P-essential normality. So P essential normality is a finer version of essential normality, which instead of compactness, it uses Schotten piece summability. So, so what we proved, so, we, uh, so I also figure out the exact range of this real number P, such that the Bergman module over the complex ellipsoid, and this is my complex ellipsoid, is, essential, is P essential normal. And this is the formula. The Bergman module over this complex ellipsoid is P essentially normal. I mean, by, by this, I mean the multiplication, right? The, the, the commutators of multiplication operators by polynomials, the commutators of them with their adjoints is P summable if and only if P is this in this range. For mm -hmm. M1, if P is strictly greater, greater than one half, and this is this formula over here. And here is a here is an imp important phenomenon that ha happens to be here. So in so let me remind you something about a strongly pseudo-convex domain. For a strongly pseudo-convex domain, the Bergman module is p essentially normal if and only if p is strictly greater than the dimension of your domain. Mm -hmm. For a strongly pseudo-convex domain. But the new feature is this one. For weakly pseudo-convex domain. There are other things at work, not only, so this little m is the complex dimension of your weakly pseudo-convex domain, right? Mm -hmm. But for this theorem, this cutoff rate, these are called cutoff rates. Cutoff rates for piece essential normality. As you see, it not only depends on the complex dimension of your domain little m, but also on this exponent pj, and they have a geometric meaning. These pjs are what are related to what John D'Angelo calls the order of compact. The order, mm -hmm. so John D'Angelo has a notion of order of compact, sorry, order of compact of a boundary of a domain which with non-singular curves. And mm -hmm. these PJs are order of compact. So the order of compact is this maximum PJs, and you will see that exactly this one happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you that in the case of a strongly pseudo-convex domain, the cutoff rate for P essential normality is exactly the dimension, the complex dimension of your domain for a strongly pseudo-convex domains. But for weakly pseudo-convex domain, the cutoff rate depends not only on the complex dimension, but also on the geometry of your domain, the geometry of the boundary of your domain. 
Okay, and also I found the same theorem for omega-2. So omega-2 is this generalized, generalized mm -hmm. ellipsoid. So the parameters are P, J, K, and A, K, and I will also figure out the exact range of P such that the Bergman module over this generalized complex ellipsoid is essential known. Okay. Okay, that's it. And let me say just one word. So to prove this one, you again, so the strategy is the same. So each of them, as Nicholas said, each of them are, are complete Reinhardt domains. So the, so, so monomials, right? Monomials give you an orthogonal basis. And I have shown you that in either of these cases, omega one and omega two, you have explicit formulas for the norm of your basis elements in terms of ratios of gamma function. And to check, to find the exact range of P such that these guys is essentially normal, you go and find the eigenvalues corresponding mm -hmm. to commutators. And then you find asymptotic formulas for them using asymptotic formulas mm -hmm. for the ratios of gamma function. Then that gives you some series and these series will come into play. And mm -hmm. the only thing, the only problem that you need to solve is you need to figure out, so these are series. So I1, I2, I3, I4, I5 are just dummy variables ranging over non-zero integers. And A1, A2, A3, these are parameters. You only need to figure out, you need to find if and only if conditions on these parameters A1, A2, A3, such that these series are convergent. As mm -hmm. soon as you solve that problem, you, you, can, you, can, you can prove these theorems and that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, questions, please. I, think well, well, no I, I, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one question is probably difficult. Uh, instead of uh, egg domains, uh, is it possible to work with arbitrary uh, convex domains in the linear sense? linear convex for convex domains convex uh, in the elementary uh, in elementary the usual sense. sense right yeah let me see do i know any work related to this work i'm not sure because you say the product of product of ball is a convex domain but it doesn't work so the poly disk is convex, right? Yeah. The poly yeah, disk yeah. is convex, this is, this right? Is a contraexample, yeah. Right. Uh, maybe mm, uh, when the closure is strongly convex, yeah. When the closure is a strongly pseudo convex, right? No, uh, strongly convex in, in the. It's strongly sense. convex. A strongly convex means that, okay, the curvatures are always positive. Mm. Ah, but uh, maybe uh, this implies strongly pseudo convex, yeah. Right. Well, uh, the question is to, to find uh, uh, something more general than egg domains, but uh, something nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the point is that, so the only technique that I have been using is use is the use of these orthonormal basis. So I haven't found any geometric way to prove this stuff. So you can use this complex machinery, right? For example, I told you about this geometric Arvis. Okay. I told you about this geometric Arvis and Douglas conjecture, right? Proved by the uh, proved by Inglis Oshmayer. So they are using advanced tools in several complex variables. They okay. use Buto de Monvel's theory. They use they use uh, Butres integral representations formulas. They also use, uh, what is it called, Carlson measures. Right, maybe with these advanced techniques, but so far I have only able to, to, to work on the Arvison's conjecture using these elementary techniques of, of basis, orthonormal basis. Uh, yes, I understand. And another question uh, uh, near the page 15, 50. Uh, when you prove the compactness of the commutator, commutators. This one? Next, 
maybe 51. 51. Yeah, yeah, what? yeah. Uh, this one, the, the computation of the uh, right. commutator. Right. Uh, as this one, this one. Right, right. Uh, so, uh, I was lost. Uh, what, what, what is the idea to prove the um, compactness of the commutator for, right. for two so, indices? So, for two right. indices. Right, right, right. So you, if you have a diagonal operator whose, whose eigenvalues are given by lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, up to, right, by sequence lambda j, right? Suppose you have a diagonalizable bounded operator on a Hilbert space whose eigenvalues is given by the sequence lambda j, j from 1 to infinity, right? Yeah, then the operator is compact, if and only if the, exactly. the sequence tends to zero. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, that is exactly the idea here. So this this commutator here is diagonalizable. The eigenvalue is given by lambda. So what you need to check, you need to check that we, when each of these, so what is alpha one, alpha m? These are the indices in alpha, in multi-index alpha. So you need to check that when either of these indices go to infinity, you need to check that this lambda goes to zero. Yeah, this part, this part is, is clear. Right, okay. And, uh, the next one uh, for two different indices. Oh, for this one. For this one? For, uh, yes, exactly. You mean, you mean, oh, okay, for this one, okay. Uh, these are not diagonalizable, but let's call it S. Let's call this commutator S. You need to check S is essentially, you need to check that S is compact or not, right? And I'm gonna tell you that an operator S is compact if and only if S as a star is compact. So this is a general theorem. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and then I'm gonna tell you that S a star is diagonalizable. This S, this commutator is not diagonalizable. But if you call it S, S a star is diagonalizable. And you can, you can check it like this. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's clear, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, here is a, okay, okay. Uh, more questions? One, one question. So if I understand correctly from what I've seen of your work, you need this, this monomial basis, right? To, right. to make the computation series essential. And, right. and because of that, uh, for other bounded symmetric domains, uh, you cannot, can you do something or? For, for what? For symmetric other, domains? Other bounded symmetric domains. Right, okay, let me tell you, this is something I understood after coming to CIMA. So at some point I was reading a survey article of Uppmayer in some handbook of complex function theory. So what he says there is that symmetric, domain, symmetric domains, bounded symmetric domains of rank strictly greater than one, they are not essentially normal. Mm. So there are some results, and, but negative, right? So, right? In general, they are not. <clears throat> right? For example, these balls, right? These balls are rank one, right? Am I right? So I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with it. But right, that's what Uppmayer says. And he gives some, so let mm -hmm. me, if you want a reference, mm -hmm. if you, how can I share my screen? How can I share? Okay, the screen. You can you can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. So this is in this book, Handbook of Analytic Operator Theory by Keju. Mm -hmm. So the chapter five is written by this guy Uppmayer, and at some point he says something symmetric. So in this section, somewhere he says this. You can find it in here. Mm -hmm. Then from this symmetric is pseudo convex. If R is rank, it's not a strongly pseudo convex. The boundary is not a smooth. Oh, it has a section on essential normality, I guess. So did I, so you asked me a question, Raul? Yes, so then 
this is mostly a theory for 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 these egg domains and mm -hmm. unit ball in the case of bounded symmetric domains, right? Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Doesn't right. work the same way for other bounded symmetric for domains. Essential, right. uh -huh. mm -hmm. For essential normality, right? For essential normality ranks, doesn't hold. Maybe okay. Maybe if you think deeply, you can find some quotients. Because what Upoyer says is that the Bergman, it's the Bergman, the Bergman module on these bounded symmetric domains of higher ranks, they are not essential no more. But you might be able to find some quotients which are essential. I mean, some some careful quotients. But you need to get deep into these results. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, questions? Uh, and uh, Reinhardt domains. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, Reinhardt domains. What is the situation with Reinhardt domains? Uh, so you are asking what is the situation of what? Of Arvesson's conjecture for Reinhardt yeah, domains? Yeah, yeah. For in general, so I have, I have. So let me share this one. So the survey that I have given you. So if you are asking about, so if you are asking about Arvison's conjecture, Arvison's conjectures is about the quotients, and these are more or less the all all the important results. I mean, and none of them attributes Reinhardt domains. So they are so one of them they are for a strongly pseudo-convex domains, and it discusses the quotients. But if you just care about the essential normality of the Bergman module itself, so I have given you several results here. So this one is about complete Reinhardt domains. So what is your, your question was about Reinhardt domains or complete Reinhardt domains, what? Uh, yes, complete. Uh, yes, this is the, the answer. Uh, so, five. so as you yeah, see, yeah. so this one, as you see, if you insist on, for example, pseudo-convex, com so first of all, the domain, if, if you want the Bergman module to be essentially normal, your domain must be pseudo-convex. So you cannot drop this one. So if you want to find essentially normal, <laughs> You need to, so that is something that this guy Salinas proof, Salinas and Raul Kerto proof. Okay, so you need to put, if you want your Bergman module to be essentially normal, you need to, you need to add this as pseudo convexness. But as, as you see for this complete run out of domains, so the answer even in C2 is not, is a deep theory that these guys develop using foliation and a lot of geometric ideas. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean they don't they don't do computations with uh, although they have complete run out of domains, but the proof is geometrical. They don't use, for example, computations with with orthonormal basis. Well, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the next question will be um, uh, complicated, but. Um, uh, somebody studied uh, other Hilbert spaces, uh -huh. uh, like harmonic functions uh -huh. or uh -huh. uh, polyanalytic functions, analogs of this, uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. conjecture. People are doing all, doing all the time, and I'm going to tell you that, for example, in this case, it is when I is principle, right? So I have stated this Arvison's conjecture for the Bergman, for the Bergman module over a strongly pseudo convex domain. So Arvison himself, so all kinds of analytic Hilbert modules and also harmonic Hilbert modules so you can put here and study the conjecture. And, and I'm going to tell you that this is not, so the questions might be very hard if you change your Hilbert module. For example, when I is principle, when I is principal, Guo Wang were the first guy who proved that this, 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 this quotient is essentially normal. But, this, but they proved it for Bergman module, for, for the Bergman module over the unit ball. But these guys, then these two famous guys, Fang and Xia, they started to investigate what happens if you replace your Bergman module with Hardy space or weighted Bergman spaces. So, that, so a lot of new phenomena turns out to be there. Okay, thank you. And in some cases, in, even, in some, even in some ways, critical ways, they can't prove that it is essentially normal. So they have no idea. So you can refer to the paper of them. So every, every year or two, they prove one paper studying the essential normality of weighted Bergman 
spaces over the unit ball mowed out by principal ideals. So the, the weight uh, on the domain uh, complicates yeah. the, the situation yeah, yeah. very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as you go, for example, the unweighted Bergman space has weight, for example, zero. When you have weight minus one, that's a hardy space. When the weight is minus dimension, I guess minus one, that's the Rory Arvison space. And right, if, if the weights get smaller and smaller, the problems get harder and harder. So I have no idea, but that's what these guys say, Fang and Shia. Okay, thank you. So I have a, a very silly question. Uh -huh. um, the uh, the beginning of your talk, you defined uh, this K1. Uh -huh. And uh, you said that you define a sum on it using direct sums. I guess this is similar to the K theory of um, vector bundles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then um, you said something about proving that it has um, negative. So does it already have that? You don't have to, you do not have to take a Grothendieck proof or anything? Because of this portion with the... No, they theory? don't use Grothendieck's construction. So because they are motivated by operator theory, and I have shown you that the definition that I have given, that is the most natural definition. So they don't, they don't produce their inverse, the additive inverse right formally by this Grothendieck's construction. So that was my question, right? So it's already there, basically. Because of this. Using Grossen, if, 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 you, if you define this K1s, right, with Grossen's construction, right, the inverse is always there, just, just, by, just by formality. No, 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 no. What, what I'm saying is, so this construction that you gave, if I understand correctly, you don't have to formally add in the negatives. They're already there because of the way that you're taking this quotient by the contact operator. No, that's a deep theorem. I, didn't, I never understood it, but that it depends on a deep theorem of Voiculescu. I mean, but it's true. What, what? It's true though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have inverse, right? They are abelian groups. The, the K1 functors, they are, the K1 of X is an abelian group. Already, without having to formally add in inverses. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. But that's a deep theorem. That's a deep theorem. So maybe, so I always, I always forgot that name. Anyway. So, okay. The, the, the name of that theorem of Voiculescu. Okay. Anyway. Well, thank you very much. Okay, since it's no more question. So thank you very much, Rahmat, again. And uh, you will talk next week. Yes, yes. Uh, after that, in March 17, we will have a talk of Kekizu. Uh -huh. And on March 24, by Giovanni. Giovanni, are you here? Giovanni, tu vas hablar en uh, 24 de marzo. Sí. Okay, great. Another okay. thing which you would like to introduce in this seminar is a kind of social service, servicio social in Espanol. What does it what does that mean? That each one by turn by tour, the first one would be Enrique. Yes, Maribel. Yes, it's Enrique Primero, yes. Yeah, Enrique, uh, which will present uh, some survey about recent paper of, about our topic, Kiopolis operator and all things related. So the idea is the turn by each one will, well, first it will be Enrique. Miguel, you will be the next. Do you hear me, Miguel? Yes. Uh, so you need to check for a month or so appearance of new papers in our subject and then to present in seminar a short survey. What was published, what is interesting, what needs to be discussed, what not. So what's the advantage of all this? First of all, each one of us will have perfect knowledge about what is going on in literature. This advantage for all of us. And the advantage for a person who is doing this report is that how to find out new papers, how to read them, and how to present a survey. So it would be like uh, each month, or if no paper essentially appear 
each two months on something like that. So we start with Enrique and see what will happen. But after Enrique, Miguel will be your turn. Okay, right. Okay, so we know a program for at least this month. Thank you very much for all and see you next time. Next week. See you. Goodbye.